even in the community, preventive medicine has had difficulty being practiced. Um, just the, the nature of our system, um, most healthcare systems are not really healthcare systems, they're medical systems, and they wait for people to have illness and then try to deal with it. Preventive medicine as a specialty has been around for over 50 years, um, and I'm board certified in preventive medicine. Um, I think that with healthcare reform, there is greater and greater emphasis on prevention. Uh, so certainly more people are doing that. And that has reached correctional settings as well. So even though our populations are relatively transient, there are still preventive kinds of strategies um, that we may want to continue, strategies that were initiated in, in the community that we would continue, strategies we may want to initiate while the person's in, uh, incarcerated. Well, in preventive medicine, we talk about uh, three levels of prevention. So we're talking about primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is when we identify someone who has no illness whatsoever, and we want to do something to try to make sure that they do not get that illness classic example for primary prevention would be an influenza vaccination. And so since flu outbreaks, especially in an, uh, with an enclosed group like a military base or a correctional facility, can be widespread and devastating, it's very important for facilities to have some kind of uh, flu intervention. And a uh, flu shot uh, is relatively benign um, for targeted populations. Part of what's important also in preventive medicine is we don't do things, we try to do things that are evidence-based, we don't just do things across the board necessarily. And so as I said, not everyone needs to get a flu shot, but there are um, people who are at, considered to be at risk um, should get that kind of intervention, and the idea is that could prevent um, the worst aspects of the particular disease. Secondary prevention is when the condition already exists but may not yet have progressed to the point of causing disease or compromising the patient's health care. And so if we can identify the condition early enough, we may be able to cure them you know, or in some manner affect their mortality, extend their, extend their life expectancy, reduce mortality. Uh, improve morbidity, reduce morbidity. Again, classic example of secondary prevention is a pap smear. So when it's negative, it's negative. It doesn't, it doesn't help in terms of an intervention. The idea is that a positive pap smear done early enough will identify a developing cancer while it's still uh, eminently treatable and curable, as opposed to waiting until a patient shows up with metastatic cancer and is very sick, at that point it's much more difficult uh, to provide treatment. Tertiary prevention is when the person has a condition and it is active, um, but again we're trying to do interventions that may um, either extend life expectancy, so we may not be able to cure, but we may still be able to influence life expectancy or morbidity. Um, an example of Tertiary prevention would be in a patient with uh, early Alzheimer's disease. There's not much we can do to treat the Alzheimer's disease itself, but many other kinds of conditions um, can affect the person's um, uh, mental level uh, because an Alzheimer's patient tends to be much more sensitive to other kinds of problems. And so treating or preventing urinary tract infections, let's say, or pneumonia, giving pneumovax uh, to an Alzheimer's patient and preventing that complication may and improve their quality of life um, and extend their life expectancy, even though we haven't directly affected the Alzheimer's process itself. I think theoretically, Correctional environment's a wonderful environment to try to implement preventive medicine. 
because we have people um, that we have easy access to as opposed to folks in the community who may or may not be coming to health care providers. Um, and we, can, we have the potential of spending more time with them and convincing them that this is something important and they have more time to focus on it because they are not focusing on lots of other kinds of things that they would focus on in the community, uh, as we all do. On the other hand, I think what works against us a bit is that many of these kinds of things, preventive medicine in general, has been perceived not as a um, purpose for the medical care system, but as something for public health. And so a lot of these kinds of interventions are done through public health agencies in the community. Um, as we heard the other day at, at a talk at the Society of Correctional Physicians from the, uh, a CDC uh, individual who's in the head of the um, communicable disease branch, um, for financial reasons, local and state departments of public health are just not going to have the resources to provide these kinds of services to do cl direct clinical intervention. So there's going to be a shift back onto the medical community to do these sorts of things like flu vaccine clinics, hepatitis vaccine clinics, and so forth. Um, so it's not entirely clear that the medical community will be ready to take on uh, those functions. So there's the analogy in is present in corrections as well. Uh, there will be great financial constraints. The sheriff has a constitutional obligation to, to deal with serious health needs. One might um, argue, you know, is preventing something way off in the future, like primary prevention, a condition a person doesn't have at all, is that a serious medical need? In a classic approach, no, it's not. It's that preventive medicine is not really considered medical practice. I would think it is. You know, preve prevent, if I can prevent something bad, have the potential of preventing something bad 10, 20 years from now, that's a valuable service, but I also, I cannot say in any one individual that I have benefited that individual. I've benefited the population, but I, I don't know because I have no crystal ball. I can't see the future. I don't know that, I, that, that that person, the person with the flu shot, that they actually would have been exposed to the virus. I think so to a certain extent, and I think it's, it helps when the risk is short term. So it tends to be easier to convince uh, correctional administrators of the value of influenza vaccine, let's say, than the value of hepatitis B vaccine, um, which is a much longer term potential risk. Um, and let's say, you know, in a, in a prison setting where let's say with, uh, with people with life sentences, okay, that they can explain, uh, accept that. In a jail setting where the population might turn over and half the people are gone in two weeks, uh, it can be difficult to justify. And so a sheriff may reasonably say, that's a public health issue. Our public health department should deal with that. And in many communities, that's what happens. There is a liaison with the health department, and the health department may come into the, send staff into the facility um, to provide these services. But what we heard at the meeting the other day is that the health community um, is going to be stretched for resources, and corrections may not be uh, a top priority for them, even though our population has the highest prevalence of many of these conditions. So it really should be. Again, the public health community does not always see things that way.